Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're all doing well. We're just about right on time here. How about that? Pretty nice. Uh, let me know if you guys can hear me okay. Hopefully you guys can hear me all right. We got, what do we have, eight, nine people here in the chat right now, which is really cool. Let me know that you can hear me. Just make sure my microphone's on. Yes, it should be. Okay, cool. We should be good to go myself up a little bit here hope you guys are doing well once again welcome to our weekly live stream show this week we're going to talk about uh, console emulation and some tape saturation because I've gotten some questions about that um, over the last couple of weeks especially after the live mixing series finished up that we did um, over the last three or four weeks if you have not seen um, the live mixing series we did the last four weeks in a row where we mixed an, an entire song from start to finish over the course of four weeks, and we did a bunch of Q&A stuff. Um, you can get that uh, course now, the full course, with all six-plus hours of video unedited. You get to see the Q&A, the, um, the, the mixing tutorial every week, um, and right now they're at 50% off. So if you're on the mailing list, you have gotten an email over the last few days and you will get one, I think, again tomorrow reminding you or Sunday that you can purchase that at 50% off and you, have a, and you get all the audio files, obviously, so you can mix the song. And we're going to take a look at that song again tonight a little bit. So if you haven't picked it up or if you've only seen part of the mixing series over the last few weeks and you want to see the whole thing, go check it out. It's really, really cool. A lot of great um, things that we talked about. We had a lot of pro some problem areas with vocals and kick drums and we did a whole mix. It was really cool. So let me know what you guys can see and hear me okay if you would. And I'll check out the chat room here. It's been a real busy day today. I'm in the middle of painting the studio and it's, oh, what a nightmare. I'm tired. I don't feel well, but I'm here. <laughs> so... David S. Uh, J is here. David, how are you? Good, good to see you. Uh, Ital Scoops is here. Hey, man, you can hear me loud and clear. That's awesome. Paul's here. Hey, Paul, what's up, buddy? Roger's here. Hey, Roger. Randall, my buddy, is here. How, how are you, Randall? I hope you're doing well. Alberto is here. Hey, man, what's going on, bud? Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Ital Scoops is from London. Hey, man. Welcome from over the pond. Welcome to the United States for the evening. <laughs> uh, let's see. David says, love using console and tape emulation. Could you do some pointers to do it better? Well, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to kind of talk a little bit about um, console emulation and tape, what it kind of does, how I kind of think about it, how you can use it most effectively. Um, and, and then we're going to, you know, we're going to listen to, you know, the mix we did last week. We're going to add some console emulation. We're going to add some tape. Um, and listen to what it does. And we're going to talk a little through it and I'll take some questions and answers. But um, if it's, um, we're not going to, we're not going to compare multiple different types of tape machines or different types of console emulation plugins. If you want to see something like that, I urge you to go out and pick up Mixing When Analog Style Plugins Made Easy, the training course. And as you can see scrolling on the screen right beneath my video, um, this weekend that is 20% off if you use the coupon code MAP. ME for mixing with analog plugins made easy 20 and that'll give you 20% off that course. Um, if you use third party plugins and you don't have that course, I said it last week and I'll say it again, you should before you do your next mix, go watch that 15 hour course. And we spend a lot of time comparing different console emulation plugins, different tape machines, different channel strips, the whole philosophy behind using those plugins. Okay, so that's the course you want to check out. We're not going to go way down deep like that tonight, but we're going to start to scratch the surface. So that's cool. So we got 11 people here, and we'll wait a few minutes for a few more people to show up. Hopefully, we have a really good turnout. Um, booth mixing and mastering. Hey, Bobby, what's up? How you doing? Um, the last four weeks that we did the live stream, we had... Uh, 40 to 45 people each night for almost the entire live stream, which is great. I'm hoping we can even get half of that tonight would be fantastic. Um, the better the turnout is, the more um, motivation it gives me to do these every week. This is five weeks in a row. I'm going to try to do this every week if people are interested. So hopefully that's cool, everybody. Again, we'll do a We'll, we'll go through the, uh, the tutorial the tutorial this week, and then I'll do a Q&A session as well. But if you want to ask a couple of questions... Um, Now's the time to do it. We're going to wait a few minutes for a few more people to hopefully show up, and then we'll dive into Studio One. So I hope you're all doing well. Now, for folks, you can't see it on screen here, but right off here to my right, 
Um, the new iMac Pro came in yesterday and I've been setting it up and it's probably going to take me uh, a week to get everything loaded in there and set up and ready to go. But I finally got the computer, started to lo load up all the applications and boy, oh boy, is it super, super duper fast compared to the computer I'm using now, which is a 2013 Mac Pro. So man, what a fast computer. I'm really excited to kind of bring that into the to the main area here over the next week or so. So that's what I've been working on. Been working on that. It's so off to my left here or off to my right here. Also decided at the last minute that it was a good time to go ahead and repaint the studio, which has been a nightmare. Not a nightmare, just a lot of work. Changing the color up, changing it up a little bit. The paint is 10 years old in here. So I've been doing that all day. So I'm exhausted. So I got my whole studios ripped apart. You don't see that, but I got it back just in time here to start the live stream. So we got 15 people here now. Uh, let's see. 101 South. Happy Friday, everyone. Hey, 101 South. Thanks for joining. If anybody here for the first time, let me know if this is the first time you've joined me on a live stream or if this is the first time you're visiting the Home Recording Made Easy channel. Let me know. I want to say hello to you and welcome you to our family. Um, as I always say, if you look at the top right hand corner of the screen, if you find any of these live streams helpful and the information I'm giving you helpful to you, you can feel free to use the super chat. Anything that you can give helps me and allows me to continue to do these things for you guys at no charge. So anything that you can give is great. You don't have to, but it's there. Use the super chat. would really appreciate it. Uh, let's see. David says, did you do one? Did you do one last week? I missed it. I was at a weekend jam session. Well, that's cool, man. Hope you had a good jam. Yes, last week was the fourth week um, of the final part of the four-week mixing series that we did. So if you want that entire course or if you missed parts of it and you want the audio files so you can mix the song and follow along with all four weeks worth of live streams, you can head over to Home Recording Made Easy. If you're on my mailing list, which I'm sure you are, um, you will get an um, email with a 50% off coupon. 50% off, half price for this weekend. Good, good, good deal. Go, go get the course if you want to see it. So that's happening this weekend. Uh, let's see. Uh, I tell scoop says as an old school guy, I like to use the BX console SSLs in the Neve. Well, that's cool because the, the, the session we're going to look in, at tonight is the session that we did the four part series that I've been speaking of. And we use the, uh, plugin Alliance SSL BX channel strip for the entire mix. And now we're going to add some tape machine and some console emulation to that. So that's really cool. And I understand I'm a big channel strip guy, big channel strip fan. Um, and again, if you don't have mixing with analog style plugins made easy, you ought to check out that course. We spend 15 hours talking about those kinds of plugins. Uh, and there's a coupon code on your screen. You can check that out. Hey, Paul, what's up, bud? Uh, hey, David, I'm trying to transform Addictive Drums to Audio in Studio 1.4. I could do it in version 3, but not 4. You should be able to do it in version 4 as well. I don't use those programs, but um, yes, you can absolutely do it. You should be able to right click on the MIDI um, region and there should be a transform or some kind of way to convert it to audio. You can absolutely do it. I don't know if they changed the way you do it from three to four. I'm not, I don't know because I don't use that feature, but I'm telling you it can be done. Um, you know, Paul, post up on the user form at PreSonus, you know, the, the community. Someone there will be able to show you really quick. Bing, bang, bang, and you'll get it done. No problem. So we got 18 people here. So let's, um, we've been on here about 18 minutes now. So let's jump on into Studio One here. Let me pull up my Studio One session. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, I should open it, huh? I had to reboot my computer because OBS was not opening before. Hopefully the live stream doesn't crash. We had some YouTube issues last week, but we, we sorted it out. Let me get uh, Studio One open and see. We got 21 people here now. This is cool. Hopefully people start to creep in. This is this is going to be great. You know, the more you guys are involved and the more you participate, the better. Um, and then we'll be doing these every week, hopefully. I can't believe I've been able to do it five weeks in a row without missing. That's astonishing. I didn't think I would get that far, but this is great. <laughs> so I hope you guys are finding this kind of stuff helpful. Look at this. Even Studio One is giving me a little bit of problems tonight. You know what it is? It's my Mac Pro. I'm, I'm glad I got the new one. Because my Mac Pro, my 2013, it needs to just be stripped down and rebooted and reinstalled everything because it's just been dragging lately. So I'm going to do that before I sell it. If anybody's in the market for a really high-end audio computer, I have a 2013 Mac Pro that's going to be for sale at a very reasonable rate. Okay, let me bring in Studio One here. Let's make sure you guys can see everything. Okay, so you should see Studio One on the screen here. Let me know that you can see that. And I'll put my cans on. 
and uh, we'll take a we'll take a look, see, and a listen. Make sure you guys can hear everything. Okie dokie. All right. So here we go. Okay. So this is the song that we've been working on over the last four weeks. This is a song by Fruition. The name of the song is Santa Fe. I'll say it again. If you've missed the live streams over the last four weeks where we mix the entire song over a four week period, primarily focusing on the, um, someone mentioned a few seconds ago, the Plugin Alliance SSL channel strip, along with a couple other plugins, but this was the main, this was the main deal. Um, and then we did some, you know, we had some problem tracks we talked about. Anyway, if you want to see that whole series, you can <clears throat> check your emails, make sure you're on my emailing list. There will be, and you can go on the Home Recording Made Easy website under the Made Easy page, Live Mixing Series Volume 1, that's this, is for sale. Um, and you can get it for 50% off um, if you use the coupon code uh, LMS, Live Mixing Series, 50, I believe is the coupon code. Okay. You can get it for 50% off for this weekend only. Go check it out. You get all the audio files, blah, blah, blah. So here's the song. So now what I've done is, um, in a way to kind of prepare for this is we're going to talk about two plugins today. We're going to talk about the Slate Digital Virtual Console Collection, the VCC, which I've used a million times in all my different products. The other product that's like this that's popular on the market is the Waves NLS, the nonlinear summing plugin, which I do have. I've done some reviews on it. You can check that out on the YouTube channel. We're not going to look at that tonight. This is the more popular one. And we're going to talk about how just adding some console emulation can add some enhancement to the mix. Now, before we start listening to this stuff, I got to say that if you're not wearing good headphones or listening to this on studio monitors, you're not maybe going to hear the effect of this um, if you're using earbuds or a laptop or something. So keep that in mind. So the way I have this set up is um, this plugin, if you don't know, is really a two-part plugin. You have what's called the Virtual Mix Bus here, which is in this gray kind of 500 module series. Uh, here we go. And I'll, I'll, I'll scroll. I'll keep my eye on the chat, make sure everything's cool, and I'll answer questions after. Um, so we have the mix bus, the virtual mix bus portion of the plugin, which go on your buses and your master bus. Okay, and this is a pretty simple plugin if you don't know how to use it. We have our input here on the top left hand side. We have our output here, input output gain. In the center, we have our six different consoles that Slate Digital emulate, emulated. We have the Brit 4KE, which is the E channel strip SSL. We have a Brit 4KG. We have the USA, which is um, an API console. We have the Brit N, which is a Neve style console. We have the Trident console, and then the RC tube, which is more of a 60s kind of a TG12345 Abbey Road kind of a deal. Okay? And you can just use the selector switch to change them all. Seeing as we're using the G channel strip by Plugin Alliance, we'll use the G console emulation. Why not? Then we have our drive knob here. The more you drive this, the more harmonic distortion and some clipping you'll get, and that could be good in a very subtle way. And then we have this group button here, and this group button allows us, we have uh, eight different groups we can assign everything to. I have everything assigned to group one. And what that means is when all the different channels, and I'll show you in a minute, is assigned to one group, and if I hit this group bypass button, it bypasses all the plugins on all the tracks, so you can get a really good A-B comparison all on all off without having to open up each individual plugin. And then we have a noise reduction here if you don't want to hear the noise, but we're using console emulation. If you want to emulate an analog console, it has noise. So the mix bus portion goes on your buses. This is on the master bus, the instance that you're looking at this now, okay? And right now it's in the off stage of turned it off. Now on our buses here in this song here, if you remember, or if you weren't here, this song has um, one, two, three, four, five, six different buses, a drum bus, a bass bus, guitar bus, keyboards bus, vocal bus, and a background vocal bus. And I went ahead and I put an instance of this plugin on every one of the buses, again, using the virtual mix bus portion of the plugin, okay? And we're using the G channel strip, okay? And everything is set to the same. Now, on the individual tracks, Okay, we have a fairly small session here. All down here in brown are our drums. Kick in, snare top, snare bottom, a floor tom, or excuse me, a rack tom, a floor tom, an overhead in a chamber or a room kind of a mic. We have a bass DI. We have a guitar, two guitars, one and two, a keyboard track in this purple color, lead vocals in yellow, lead vocal, background vocal, vocal two, um, and vocal three are both background vocals. Okay. And on each one of these tracks, I put is the, um, nope, we're going to look at tape in a minute. Hold on. 
forget tape, we'll get to that. As the second plugin as the insert, I put the virtual console collection on. Now, as you can see, this part of the plugin is called the virtual channel. The virtual channel is designed to go on each of the individual tracks, kick, snare, toms, overheads, bass, guitar, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, everyone following me? And again, it's set up to the same thing as what's on the buses. I'm set to group one. So because I'm set to group one, everything is set to the 4K G channel strip because we're using the G channel strip by Plugin Alliance. Okay, and the drive is all set at kind of 50%. Okay, so what we have in summary is one of these virtual console plugins on every one of the tracks, on all the individual tracks that we talked about. We have it on the buses and we have it on the master bus. Okay. Now I haven't done anything tweaking wise except choose the console that we wanted to use. And the reason why, once again, we're using the SSLG channels, the SSLG console on the VCC is because we're using a G channel strip here by SSL. So I just thought it'd be nice, a nice pairing. You don't have to do that, but that's what we chose to do. So now what I'm going to do is, as you can see, hopefully, if you look at the, the second plugin in the chain, which is where the console is, the first one is a tape machine. We'll talk about that in a minute. I have them all powered off. They're not on. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to play back a, a little bit of music here with them all off. And then what I'm going to do is at the stroke of a button, I'm going to turn just the virtual console collection on just by turning this on and off. Okay, you can see the second row is lighting up on and off. That's it. Just so you could hear what the accumulative effect is. Now, again, we haven't set, I haven't tweaked it. I just dropped it on the channel. Let's see what it sounds like. I have no idea. I'm doing this live. Okay. So here we go. So here's the music with it off. And I go walking way. There's quartz in the gravel. There's Jasper in the yard. Now we're going to turn it on. Can you hear the difference? Now it is somewhat subtle. And the reason why I'm turning them all on and off across the entire mix like this, as opposed to one track at a time, is you'd have a very hard time audibly hearing what one track on and off is doing. This plugin is really meant for more of an accumulative effect kind of a vibe. So what I hear, because again, I always say this, I never know what it's gonna sound like over YouTube until I watch the stream back later, if I have the opportunity to do that, is that I hear that things get a little more open, has a little bit more clarity, a little bit more presence, and it has a little bit more, I, I, the word that comes to mind is more of a richer sound. It sounds a little more polished, a little bit more rich in a very subtle way. And when I take it away, you just hear things kind of fall flat a little bit. Okay, let's do that again. So right now it's in the on position. I'll play it back a little bit and then I'll turn it off and just listen to what happens when I turn it off. And I go walking way. There's quartz in the gravel, there's Jasper in Off. And nobody's watching you. It's just the painted Mother Mary's the cowboys made of bronze. Okay, can you hear the difference? Hopefully you can. If you cannot, later on after the stream's been posted on YouTube, you can always go back and rewind this and do this again. Okay, so now how do I kind of set this up? What is my kind of thinking? Well, let's start out like on just kind of the master bus here. Let's just kind of start as the master bus. Okay, so what am I looking for? How hard am I looking to hit this? Now, there are no rules in any of the way you do this. I'm just showing you how I kind of use this, okay? So this is the master bus. This is after everything is going through all the individual channels. Let's look and see how hard we're hitting this plugin. <music> Okay, so what I typically do, and again, I haven't preset this up, is I'm looking for it to hit somewhere around the 12 o'clock to one o'clock mark. You can see where we get in the red here, maybe on some of the larger peaks of loudness, it may go into the red a little bit. What I don't like to do is I don't want it so it's pinned like this. We're 
Now, for certain styles of music, this is on the master bus now, on individual tracks, you may find that desirable. And again, what is that doing audibly versus not hitting it so hard? It's giving you a little less when you're a little bit more conservative, a little bit less um, uh, harmonic distortion. You got to be careful because the more you push this on each individual track, the more audible distortion you're going to hear. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. Depends on the mix style of music and your personal taste. What I tend to do with these kinds of plugins, I tend to hit them conservatively. Okay, because as I said a few seconds ago, this is more of an accumulative effect thing. Okay, so by hitting it, you know, around that 12, 1 o'clock, maybe hitting the red a little bit on each individual track, the accumulative effect of that across an entire mix is going to give you that nice push where it's not way too distorted, you don't have anything clipping, and things are just kind of sounding richer, as I talked about a minute ago. Okay, so that's on the master bus. So now the way I kind of start this as I'm using this, and we're not gonna go through in each individual track and set it up because it would just take too long, is let's say I would start down here on my, on my kick drum. <laughs> It's almost set up perfectly, but like something like this kick drum, which if you remember from the mixing portion a few weeks ago, if you were here, this is not a big slam, a kicky in the face, metallic, a kick drum. This is more of a laid back, kind of a pillowy vibe, right? So when I look at the way this is being hit, I might hit this kick drum a little bit harder. You don't have to, just a little bit. So I could turn up my input a little. So if I turn it up three or four dB, that's kind of where I would set this for this kick drum. And then I would go to the snare and I would do the same thing. Now keep in mind for people that are following along and paying attention, if you've been around for the last few weeks, because I'm putting this plugin on after the fact, meaning we've already mixed everything through this channel strip over the last four weeks. So how you now hit this channel strip because it's next in line and the inserts is going to be a little different. And we're not going to go back and tweak all of that, but keep that in mind. The order in which you put these plugins on and the way you kind of funnel through them as you're working from the mix from scratch is important. I'm doing this completely backwards of what you would typically do. Because remember, the signal flow is going from the virtual console into this plugin, okay? So now that I'm pumping up the input, I'm probably hitting this a little too hard. And I am, I'm compressing it more than I would, would the way I set this was about three dB of compression. Now I'm compressing about six dB on this kick drum. Why? Because the signal going into the plugin is heavier, therefore the compressor is gonna react faster. Just a point of reference, okay? Just so you, for people, cause some of you that have been around, We'll, well, maybe we'll mention that. So I realized that. And for people that didn't know that, now you know, okay? So then I would go over to the snare. Ooh, so again, I probably hit this a little harder. And then what you can do, if you're going to boost it up more than a few dB, you can turn down the output to level match the plug and that's the other thing you want to try to do. We won't do that here. I'm just trying to demonstrate to you. So what I'm doing is I'm going through each one of my individual tracks. And this again, I'll say it again. This is before we would ever use compression and EQ. This would be one of the first things I would do in the mix. Set this up through all the individual tracks. Make sure I'm hitting it at the level that I want to hit it at. Hit it at the sweet spot, which again is right, whoops, there we go. And as I, as I got through all my individual drums, then I would come over to my drum bus because this is also on the drum bus. Okay, and I would see how is that now affecting my drum bus. We gotta move to 
wanted to hit a little harder. Okay, and that's how I would kind of set it. And then I would go to my bass and then to my bass bus and then to my guitars, set that up to my guitar bus. And I would kind of just, again, making sure we're not slamming things unless it's a, unless it's a conscious decision to do that because you like that kind of clipping sound on a certain instrument, say a bass guitar maybe, or whatever, or snare drum, whatever. And then I would just kind of step through it from the tracks to the buses to the master bus. Okay, and that's how I kind of set that foundation. And as you heard a few minutes ago, what that does sonically to this mix is it just gives it that extra, say 10% of putting that final sound on it. It gives it more of that warmth and more of what sounds right. Meaning sounding right if you're used to listening to records that were recorded in big studios, professional records back in the day, even up through today, where they're recording on these kinds of old, these kinds of consoles, they have a sound to them. Okay, there's also a little bit of compression going on in there because anytime you're driving um, audio through analog circuitry or simulated analog circuitry, there's going to be a little compression that happens as well. There's going to be some tonal differences, gives you a little bit of an EQ shift. Okay, so it just kind of sweetens things up to take some of the harshness out of the signal if there is any. Um, and then it kind of just gets you, gets you a nice foundation before you start processing with compression and EQ, even though in this example, we're doing it completely backwards. Okay. Does that make sense? Everybody, everybody following me, 27 people rock and roll, man. We're going to get to all the questions. Don't you worry. Okay. So that is how we were setting up, um, um, the virtual console collection. Okay. Now one last thing that we'll jump to tape. Now, some people will say, or some people have asked, and this is a very good point, even though these particular plugins by Slate Digital, even the Waves one, is very low CPU intensive, okay? These are designed, as I said, to be put on all the tracks. Now, if you have an older computer, and if you don't have at least 16 gigs of memory, and you're not using at least a quad core processor in your computer, and let's say you have a session, this happens to be only 14 tracks plus six buses, we have a 20 track session, it's small. Let's say you had a 75 track session and you don't have a, a more recent, faster processor computer. You could be challenged to put 75 of these plugins in your session, your computer would probably bog down, okay? One of the biggest um, problems or concerns that people have when you use these kinds of third-party plugins or when we use channel strips like we did in the last four weeks where we took that um, plug in alliance channel strip and put it across 20 tracks. Let's say that was a 75 track session. Can you put 75 channel strips, 75 tape machines, which we're going to talk about in a minute, 75 instances of the virtual console collection? Probably not. Unless you have a really fast processor with a ton of memory in it. Okay. That's the challenge to setting up your DAW like an, like a true analog studio. That's how you have to do it. But what if you don't have the computer power do it, to do it? Do you need to go out and do something stupid like I did and buy a $7,000 iMac Pro that's sitting over here on the side waiting to be commissioned? No, you don't need to do that. There's some things that you can do to work around that. Let me show you. So what I've done now is I've turned all those plugins off on all the individual tracks. And I'm just using them on the buses. Drum bus, bass bus, guitar bus, keyboard bus, vocal bus, background vocal bus. So instead of having 20 instances of this plugin in play i only have six and on the master bus let's hear what that does to the overall sound right we knew what it sounded like when we had everything in the kitchen sink let's listen to just the buses what does it do okay so we're just going to highlight the buses and we're going to play back that same piece of music keep in mind it's not turned on on the individual channels is it if it is let's turn it off hold on let me make, let me let me double check myself i don't want people to get all excited all right, so they're all turned off on the individual channels. They are only turned on on the buses. Let's hear it and then we'll take it away. And I go walking where there's quartz in the gravel, there's Jasper in the yard. And nobody's watching you. 
poor. The painted Mother Mary's the cowboys made of bronze. After. A lot more subtle, and it should be because we're only doing this across six tracks as opposed to 20 tracks, but it does add something there. It adds a little bit of depth to it. It gets a little bit more clarity. It doesn't have the same audible, you know, on and off where you go, wow, I can really notice that as it does across all the tracks, but it does work and it is helpful. Now, again, we didn't set them up across all the tracks perfectly as I talked about, and gain stage it perfectly. Once you get everything kind of dialed in, it may be a little bit more noticeable. But that is one way to get around it, is just do it on the buses, okay? Don't do it on all the tracks if you can't. That's how it's designed, but you don't have to do that. Make sense? Okay? So that's our virtual console. Now I'm gonna shut them all off uh, on the console because I just wanna talk a little bit about tape, okay? Let's shut them off. So now let's talk about tape for a minute. Again, and I'm gonna use the virtual tape machine by Slate Digital. You can use any tape machine. I got 10 of them from 10 different companies. They all sound different. And someone talked to last week in, in our live stream, someone asked some questions about tape and how I felt about tape saturation. Now tape saturation is, um, is another wonderful thing. It's a lot like the virtual console collection in that it's another analog piece of gear. It sounds different. What does tape do for you? Tape does a couple of things for you. One, it acts like a compressor, okay? It does. The more you, harder you hit tape, the more compressed the signal is gonna sound. The other thing that tape can do for you when you have things that are very harsh, maybe, um, uh, real high-pitched guitars or, or things like that, we have that kind of top end that kind of bothers your ear, this will smooth off that top end, okay? It kind of smooths off the top end, smooths off the bottom end, and just kind of makes everything nice and round and kind of uh, warm sounding, okay? Now, just like with the virtual console collection, there, the harder you hit this thing, signal going in, the more um, coloration you're going to get, the more compression you're going to get, which is important to understand, and also the more harmonic distortion you're going to get. Now, that can be desirable or maybe it's not desirable. In most cases, just like with the VCC, I don't like to slam this thing and pin it. I'm looking to hit it pretty good around that 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock mark, not trying to pin anything. Now, there's a few things on a tape machine, depending on which plugins you have, which can alter the sound a little bit. Things like the bias, things like the type of tape formula, like this particular plugin has two different types of tape formula, two different kinds of tape physically that they modeled. They're all gonna sound a little different from each other in a very subtle way. Again, just like with the Virtual Console Collection, this is a, um, an, more of an accumulative effect thing. Once again, it's designed to not only go on your master bus, but to really go on all your individual tracks, just like the virtual console collection. But you don't have to, but that's where you're gonna hear the you're gonna hear it more and you may get the most benefit out of it. Okay, so now the thing to keep in mind about tape, the one setting that is really kind of crucial that you gotta know that makes a really big difference is the inches per second or the IPS, IPS, inches per second. Inches per second really means how fast does the tape spin? through the tape heads. Most tape machines will have 15 ips per second or 30. And as you can see, as I turn it to 30, you can see the tape reels are spinning faster. As I go to 15, they're gonna slow down a little bit. Some tape machines will go down to seven and a quarter inches per second, which gets even slower. What's the audible difference? Well, the audible difference is the slower the tape, the more compression you're gonna to tend to get, the little bit warmer it's gonna sound. A little, the, the higher the ips, the higher the 30 inches per second, is going to sound a little bit more transparent. It's not going to be as noticeable sounding. Which do you pick? It really depends on the source material, and it really depends on the style of music and the way it was recorded. Okay. Um, a good set of guidelines that you can start with so you don't get too confused and cr drive yourself crazy is on the master bus, which this is what this particular one that you're looking at is, I may put it on 15 ips per second. And on the individual tracks, I put it on 30. 
And again, that's just general. That's how I did it in this particular session. Don't do that every time, but you have to experiment with it because there is a difference audibly. Now on every tape machine too, well, not everyone, but on this particular plugin, this happens to be two plugins in one. As you can see over here in the top right-hand corner, hope everybody's good here, okay, cool. We have the machine type. We have a 16 track tape machine, a two inch tape, 16 track machine. And they also modeled the half inch two track machine, the mastering. So if you think about a way an analog studio is kind of set up, and if you wanted to kind of make your DAW kind of be like an analog studio, how would the signal flow? Okay, it would flow from the live floor into a 16 track, a multi track tape machine, okay? out of that tape machine into your console or your channel strip or what have you, your VCC, from there through your buses, through all your effects, blah, 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 out of the console into a, a, um, a tape deck, a two track tape deck, which is what this is, okay? When you set it on the two track mode, okay? When you open up on the individual tracks, like if I come down here to the kick drum, for example, I have it set up so this is on the 16 track machine and you can see it's at the 30 ips per second and it's a little bit faster now there are all other all other kinds of settings that you can go in here and you can uh, adjust things adjust the bias and the level and all of that and you can get into all of that and you can read the you can change the wow and the flutter and noise reduction how much hiss do you want to hear because tape has a lot of hiss in it that's why your old favorite records, when you listen and you put the record on before the music starts playing, you hear that hiss. You know what that is? It's the tape machine, probably. It's what gives the song that character. You could decide to keep it. You could decide to get rid of it. Read the manuals. Every tape machine's a little different. And they all make subtle differences. I don't get too crazy with that in the individual settings. I play with them a little bit if I feel like I need to. But if you get a good plug-in, they usually sound good, pretty good out of the box, like this one does. So the way I have this set up, and we'll do an A-B comparison, is we have these as the first instance on every track. Okay, the VCC was number two, the tape machine is number one. Why? Because that's how I'm kind of, in, and again, you don't have to do it that way. You could put the VCC first and the tape machine second. It doesn't really matter. But I, if I'm thinking of my studio, my DAW here, Studio One, if I'm thinking of it as, I'm in an old, I'm in an old school studio. I'm in, a, I'm in an analog studio. How would that signal flow? It would go from the floor to the tape machine to the console, through the bus, out to a tape machine, okay? And in between there, you'd have some outboard compressors and EQs, which we'll talk about in another lesson, okay? So I'm trying to set it up in that way. You can always reverse the plugins. That's what's great about the digital world. You can do whatever the hell you want, but that's how we're going to do it. So I have these set up again on every single track. And just like, let me uh, turn them all on here for a second. Okay, I haven't said anything. I just dropped them on in its default settings. Now I don't have them on the buses. I just have them on the individual tracks and I have it on the master bus. Now, some of you may say, well, why wouldn't you put it on the buses like the virtual console collection? You can, I have, just for simplicity reasons, I didn't. Do you need to do that? No. Will it make a difference? A little bit. It'll sound a little different. You need to experiment. But right now it's just on the master bus, okay? And it's on the individual tracks. So let me go ahead. And all the virtual consoles are turned off. This is just with the tape machine off. And then I'll turn the tape machine on and let's see what it sounds like. I have no idea because I just dropped them across all the tracks. So let's listen. So what do you hear? I don't know. I won't know till I watch it back. What I hear is the snare gets a little bit more present. The kick gets a little bit more pillowy, a little bit more punchy. Okay. Now, again, I have no idea how these are set up, how hard we're hitting these tape machines. By the sound of it, probably not very hard. So let's look at the kick drum. How hard are we hitting it? Not very hard. 
So just like with the virtual console, I would probably crank up the input a little bit on these. And what's great about a plug-in like this, and a lot of tape machines do this, as you turn up the input, the output will automatically turn down. It's linked. So you can don't have to worry about turning it up and then coming over and turning down the output to level match them. It does it for you. Now, if you want to unlink that, you click this little link button here, and now they're completely in independent of each other. Little trick. A lot of people don't know that about this plugin. The other thing I want to do, I'm going to be quiet for a second. I want you to listen. Turn up your monitors for a second. I won't play the music. I'm not going to blow you out and listen to what I hear. Okay, what you should hear is you should hear the tape hiss. That familiar thing that you heard when you put your Neil Young record down, <laughs> needle down on, the, on a Neil Young record back in the 70s, right? You hear the tape hiss, okay? Now again, you can go into the settings and you could go in and you could turn down the noise adjustment. You could turn, you could play around with the bias. You could do all that stuff. Someone said in here, is it a little bias heavy? Probably, I don't know. We're not getting into all the, hey, Tony, what's up, brother? We're not getting into all the nitty gritty of that stuff. You can read the manual on your individual tape machine. You could tweak this thing to death, okay? And there's some value in that. I'm not, I'm not just brushing off his question. We're not doing that in this session though, okay? Um, so I would turn this up. Just like with the VCC, the signal was a little conservative. It probably is here as well. There's the top snare. I'm barely hitting it at all. So we got to hit a little harder than this. Okay, so if I know that most of these tracks are going to have that problem, and again, we're doing this in the complete opposite way that I would normally do it. So let me just assume for a second, I'll turn, well, oops, I could turn up um, a few of these just to see if we can hear a more audible difference. Let's turn this one up a little bit. We'll turn up the the bass guitar. Okay, this is the bass guitar. Bass guitar looks pretty good. Guitars are a little light, so I'd crank up the input. That's the keyboard track, okay? So now that I've turned up a handful of them, let's see what happens if I turn them all on and off again. Does it sound any different audibly? It will a little bit, okay? Let's turn off, we'll start with the tape machine on, then we'll turn it off. There's quartz in the gravel, there's Jasper in the yard. And nobody's watching you. It's before. It's just the pain in my Cowboys made of bronze. We're gonna move someday. We're gonna move to Santa Fe. To Santa Fe. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, it gets a little bit brighter on the snare now that I've cut, I've turned up the input gain on some of these plugins. It also doesn't, it also cuts the tran, you listen to it on the snares where you can really hear it. It, it softens the transient a little bit. And you say, well, why does it do that? Because it's a compressor, kind of, right? Okay, Did everybody hear the difference? Everybody with me, 24 people here still, excellent. Now, what's the next logical thing you think I'm gonna do? Well, now that we have a tape machine and we have a virtual console collection, when you put them both in the mix, what does that do? Okay, I don't know, let's find out. So now, let's turn them all on and off. We'll turn all the consoles, we'll get all the console collections on, right? Turn them all on, okay? So now we're gonna play the tape machine and the console collection. How am I gonna do that? I'm gonna have to turn them off both rows, right? Yeah, I'm gonna turn off one row at a time. Okay, that's no big deal. So, 
We're going to start with tape machine into the console collect VCC, and we're going to take them away. Okay, we're going to see what the accumulative effect of a tape machine in the virtual console, what it's doing to our overall mix. Here we go. And I go walking Big difference, huge difference, and it's not even set up really. It's dropped on in its default setting as you saw me tweak it a little bit. But if you really dialed this in before you went to your channel strip, as we talked about earlier, you can hear what a difference this makes, okay? That's what console emulation and tape machine can do. Now, how that kind of ties in to what we may have talked about a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about how we're setting up our channel strips. Now remember, the signal flow is the tape machine into this, into the channel strip, and that would be the order that I would put these in. Then I would set my compression and my EQ up here. This kind of explains in part why when I set up these compressors on individual tracks, I typically only set them up to do a two to three dB of compression. I don't over compress anything on individual tracks. I save that for parallel compression, which we talked about last week, right? Why? Because when you start to use all these types of plugins, tape machine, it's a compressor, the console emulation, it's a compressor, the channel strip is a compressor. That's just, let's say on the kick in mic, then we go to the console collection on the kick on the drum bus compressor. Then we go to a drum bus compressor compressor. Then we go to the console collection on the master bus, a compressor. And then sometimes like we did in our last mix, we'll have a master bus compressor compressor. So how many times have we compressed that kick in mic seven different times? Okay. Seven. And that's why everything is done in very small doses. Because if you're not careful, you can easily with seven compressors, think about putting seven compressors on the individual track. Just go compressor one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And someone last week asked me about stacking compressors. Why don't you stack compressors? You should have stacked compressors. Well, when you're using a tape machine in a console emulated plugin in a channel strip, you are using stacking compressors. But a lot of people don't think of it that way. They think of tape machine, they call it tape saturation and that word saturation. It's like, a, it's like a buzzword that people don't really understand. What does saturation really mean? It's compression. Is it harmonic distortion and some digital, you know, analog and nonlinearities and all those funny words that we tend to use us techie engineers. And I know there's a few of you here. Yes. But what in, in the end of the day for the layman, for the average person, think of it as a compressor. All those other fancy words that you hear everyone on YouTube talking about, and sometimes I use them to, to my, my more advanced students and understand what we're talking about, is it, it's it, all it really means, it's a compressor. Okay, tape saturation is a compression. That's all it is. The harder you hit it, the more it's going to compress. Yes, the tape machine plugin will sound different from a compression point of view than let's say just a straight up compressor that's on this channel strip, but it's still a compressor. The only difference is it's gonna to sound tonally a little different, okay? And the way you kind of stack these things together through the course of a mix is what's gonna give your mix its unique kind of sonic footprint, which basically means, that, you know, the simplest way to say it is your mix is gonna to sound tonally a little different than my mix, depending on the plugins that you choose and the plugins that I choose, okay? Does that make sense? I hope everybody's following that. If this is all new to you, I said at the beginning of the show, if you're coming in late, you need to go and you use these kinds of plugins or you think you want to use these kinds of plugins. You need to go get mixing with analog style plugins made easy on my website. Okay. And here's the coupon code. We'll get back to studio one, right? M-A-P-M-E 20, map me 20 at checkout gives you 20% off that course, which means you'll pay less than 30 bucks for it. Okay. 
that course is 15 hours long and we talk in even more depth than I'm talking about with you here. It's extremely important that when you use these plugins that you understand what they do and how they affect each other and ultimately how they affect the signal. Because if you don't really know how to understand this, then you're not going to get the best, the most effective use out of it. And that's why a lot of people buy these plugins and hope that if I just put the plugin on my mix, my mix is going to sound great. And most times it doesn't sound great. It, does, it Sometimes it can make your mix sound worse if you don't understand these, some of these basic concepts, okay? So that's why I always suggest mixing with analog style plugins. So for the guys here and the gals in the room that have that course, and I know a lot of you do because I recognize your names, Chime in and let people know how do you have you if you've seen that course, what do you think of it? Is it worth what I'm telling you it's worth? Please, I want your I want you to help the people that may have not heard of that course before. Okay? So that is what console emulation and tape emulation could do to your mix in a very subtle way. It could give it a more finished sound that gives it that more analog old school sound. Okay, and I have demos of these plugins all over the YouTube channel. You can go check out the individual ones. Again, this tape machine is going to sound different from another tape machine. You know, they're all going to sound a little different, but they virtually all do the same thing. Okay, I hope that helps. So we'll get, oh, we got a chat room. You know, and I don't understand why the chat room is all, let me go, let me fix that. My goodness, I don't know why the chat room got all scrunchy like that. It shouldn't have done that. And one of the things of having the chat room here on the screen is really cool is we all can see each other chatting. Technical difficulties. Hold on a second. <laughs> we have a chat room this week. It's just not sized properly. Although I did size it properly before I went live here. Oops. Don't do that, Dave. That's not going to help you get where you need to go. Oh, my Lord. You know what it is? Because I can't see it because it's up on my other screen. Can we get this thing so it's sized properly, please? So let's take some questions. First of all, was this helpful for you? Did anybody here not understand this stuff at all or, or had a little understanding and now has a little bit better understanding? That would be the ultimate goal. Okay, we got a chat room now. How about that? <laughs> okay, 28 people still here, very cool. All right, let me scroll back up a little bit. I'll take some questions. And then, uh, so if you ask a question earlier, ask it again, because I'm not going to go all the way to the top. I'm just going to look at the ones that I've, uh, let's see. After Tony's sweaty spaghetti. Hey, what's up, brother? He says, Dave, I asked you a few shows back to recommend a good all-around compressor VST. And you said the Wave CLA 76. I bought it and could not be happier. Thank you so much. Hey, well, thanks, man. Great plug in the CLA 76. And right now, well, go check the website. Um, four or five days ago, Waves put every one of their plugins on sale for $29. You can't beat the, their plugins for $29. So the CLA 76 is a great pack. Um, all their plugins are really good, but that's really good. I'm glad that you liked it. Uh, let's see. Tony says, yeah, that tape machine really brings out the low end. Yes, it does. I'm glad you can hear that over YouTube, Tony, because like I said, sometimes I have no clue. Um, but yeah, no, it does. It will bring out the lows. It will bring out the highs a little bit and it'll round things off. It'll take some of the harsh edges off of it. Okay. Let's see. 101 South. Hey, 101 South says, yes, thank you for breaking that down. No problem, man. I'm glad it, uh, if that, uh, helps you. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Paul says, thank you very much, Dave. Hey, thanks, Paul. Thanks for joining. Any questions at all? Now's the time to ask. We almost got 30 people here. This is great. Again, another great turnout. Once again, if you found this, in this stuff helpful, hit the super chat. Help me out. Um, if you did not see the last four weeks, do you want to see the, this whole song that we're listening to? If you want to mix it all, get the audio files, go out to the website, Live Mixing Series Volume 1. You get 50% off for this weekend only. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dave, David SJ says, which is the analog course on? Um, oh, you're talking about mixing with analog style plugins made easy. That's the name of the course. I know it's a long title. <laughs> mixing, go to the website, go to the made easy page. Okay. With all the made easy courses, mixing with analog style plugins made easy. Make sure you use your coupon code, get your 20% off. M A P M E two zero <laughs> map me two zero. Uh, let's see. Tony says, yeah, I've gotten Compression Made Easy, and Dave is an incredible teacher. Hey, thanks, Tony. Uh, yeah, Compression Made Easy is really cool as well. We don't really, um, that's kind of, 
we talk about different compressors like we do in, in the mixing with analog style plugins course. But the mixing with analog style plugins course is really more about how you use these plugins in the most effective way. It kind of takes what we just did tonight and we go 10 times deeper and we compare different channel strips, the sound of different types of channel strips. We, we listen to five or six different tape machines. We AB them so you can hear the differences. We do the same thing with the um, console emulation. We use the NLS by Waves and the VCC and others. Um, in this way, if you you can you can hear me demo a lot of these plugins and you can hear the difference before you go out and spend any money and find out which ones you like. Okay, so that's what's really cool about it. Okay, David said he just found it. Okay, great. Yeah, go use the coupon, David. Don't pay full price. All right. Cool. What other questions do we have? Um, was this a valuable lesson for you guys? You did you guys like this lesson? Is there anything you know? I'm going to do more like this next week. We're going to pick another topic. Okay. But is this, you guys find this helpful? I, I want to know that. And what other questions you guys have, go ahead and ask. We've been on here a little over an hour. Um, I will stay on as long as there's questions. If not, I will head out because I've been painting all day. <laughs> I haven't eaten since 1130 this morning and it's now 8 p.m. my time. Um, and so, yeah, so I'll stay on as long as you want me to, but I, but then I'm going to split. Uh, Tony says, yes, that's what confuses me. I don't know which one to pick. Um, what do you mean? Which course to pick, Tony? Is that what you mean? Um, or which plugin to pick? <laughs> if it's which plugin to pick, join the club, brother, because <laughs> they're all, they all sound good on their own. And which one do you pick really, you know, really depends. And again, that gets back to, I've said this many times before, but we have a lot of first timers here. So, um, when people see all my plugins and they see me using different plugins, like, wow, what in the, why do you need five different tape machine? I think I got seven different tape machine plugins from four manufacturers. Why do you need all of those? Well, first you don't need all of those. You only really need one, but remember they all sound different, right? And, and you'll start to, once you start to have say two or three different tape machines, for example, and they all sound a little different. You may find on R&B music, you like the Waves tape machine a lot better because it has a certain sound to it that doesn't sound like the Slate Digital one. You see what I mean? So you can start to fall down that rabbit hole how, how, how deep you want to really get into the craft of mixing. You'll find that we have all these things because they're all different tools. And I've said this a million times before as well. I said the analogy is think of it as a painter, right? The painter's got his palette. He doesn't only have one sh one color blue. He has 10 different shades of blue. Some of them look almost identical, but there's some subtle differences. It's the same thing with plugins. Some of them sound pretty damn close. There's subtle differences and some sound way different from each other. So that's why you'll see, you know, folks have a lot of these different plugins. Now, the other reason why I have a lot of these different plugins is because I teach for a living. And I, and I want to show you these different things and show you how you can use them most effectively so you can make an educated decision. If I wasn't a teacher and just a mixing engineer, would I have as many of these plugins as I have? No, I would not. I would pick one or two companies I really liked and I would just go with it. But that's the other reason too. Okay, so there you go. Um, but yeah, but that's the problem. <laughs> uh, let's see. David asked, David SJ asked, have you ever heard or have tried the car the, the kaz wrong true iron plugin no i've never heard that name before no i have not uh tony says yeah which plugin white which take a uh, which tape machine is going keeps me going back and forth yeah you know they're all good you know again when people say which one what would, would, would i what I recommend, well, I said, you know, again, again, it depends on your budget affordability, what plugins you like. You know, one thing I say about these analog plugins, for someone that's new to them, most bang for your buck is the Slate Digital stuff, right? You pay a subscription, a monthly subscription, I think of $14 a month, and you get all their plugins, all their compressors, all their EQs, all their console emulations, their tape machine, everything. It's a great bang for the buck if you're someone that's new. If you're someone who's been doing this a while and you have one flavor tape machine, well, maybe you pick up another one. But to get started, I like the Slate Digital one because it's simple. When you get into some of the other tape machines, there's a lot more controls. It could be a little bit more overwhelming on how to use it. The Slate Digital is pretty simple in that way. Um, so that's kind of why I recommend it. 
Uh, let's see. Oh, 101 South did a nice uh, a donation. Thank you so much, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you for using the super chat. It helps me a lot. It allows me to continue to do this every single week for free <laughs> is that I, you know, to use my time, anything that people can help with is great. Again, you know, it's whatever you can give is, is perfect. It allows me to say, okay, enough people are interested and there's enough donations. I don't mind doing these every week because these take a lot of time to do guys. So anyhow, thank you so much. Uh, Loco bro. Hey man, what's up? I'm currently using studio one studio one for artist. Is it worth upgrading or just buy the VST or in the, um, audio units add on? Well, that depends. If you want the mastering suite, the mastering part, the project page and go with the pro version. Ultimately what people end up doing, I find at least my students, they start with just getting the add on going to save a few bucks, right? And ultimately, two months later, they end up upgrading because the more they get into this, they go, oh, now I want to master my stuff and they don't have the mastering page or I want to be able to do this or do that. I want to be able to use MP3s. Oh, I can't do that unless I get the MP3 pack. And then in the end, they end up upgrading anyway. You know, um, there are several times through the course of the year where PreSonus puts the upgrade on sale. I think it just happened recently. Um, you can check their website. But I don't know. I mean, if, if you do a lot of recording or a lot of mixing and this is your main thing, Studio One, and you use it all the time, it's worth the professional version's worth it, especially for the mastering piece of it, you know, which, you know, mastering is a whole other thing we can do a lesson on. I do have a course called Mastering Made Easy where we use that project page. Um, so, that, you know, it really depends. If money's real tight, man, then I'd say just go with the upgrade for now. But don't be surprised if a few months down the road you end up upgrading anyway, and then the money that you just spent is kind of wasted. So think of it that way. But yeah, is it worth it? Yes. If you can afford it, it's worth it. Uh, let's see. Any other questions, everybody? So I got 30 people here, man. This is fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you again so much for joining. Next week, I don't know what the topic will be. We'll see. <laughs> I'll come up with something. Um, we'll, we'll do something next week that's pretty cool. Um, and we'll, we'll do this. So any other questions, anything at all? We've been on here about an hour and 15 minutes and the turnout has been great. And I appreciate that. And hopefully these, um, this, these kinds of plugins are starting to make more sense for you. What else? What else? What else? Anything else? If there's nothing, I'll scoot out of here and get some dinner. <laughs> and finish painting and I'm excited I've been loading my I've been spending all since last night getting my new iMac Pro loaded up with all my applications it's taken some time but uh yeah I'm going to be looking forward over the next week or so getting that in, in inserted in here man what you want to talk about one fast computer my lord um I'm really happy with it. it's gonna look in the in the display on the thing is beautiful by the way that 5k display man looks amazing amazing so yeah, that'll be interesting. And I'll do some videos on that as well. Okay. Last call for questions. If there's no other questions, I am going to scoot out of here. Um, this was fun. And um, again, a shorter lesson. But once again, if you're someone who doesn't use these kinds of plugins, you ought to. If you're just a stock plugin person, nothing wrong with that, by the way. Hopefully you can hear tonight what the difference is by adding a little bit of this these kinds of plugins, what it can do to your mix. It's the one thing that stock plugins can't do. Stock plugins are very transparent sounding. Now, if you're a Studio One user, you have the opportunity to use things like the Console Shaper Pro, or if you want to buy, or the Console Shaper, which is their kind of their kind of their VCC, you know, emulation, or you can pay for the Console Shaper Pro, which gives you a couple of different consoles that they emulated. Those are nice, and I have plug-in reviews of those on my website. And if you're a part of MixingMadeEasy.net, I've used those in a couple of the months of content. But to me, they don't have that same sound like the VCC or like the NLS. They fall a little short. They're great plugins, and if you get the console shaper, which is free with Studio One, professional, it gives you something which is better than nothing. Um, so you can use those. And PreSonus does have a bunch of analog-style plugins, all their compressors and EQs and such. Um, are all good stuff. And again, I have, I have reviews on every single one of their plugins on my YouTube channel. Just go check that out. So, anywho. Uh, let's see. Okay, a couple more questions here. People want me to stick around. That's okay. Oh, Steven says, go get some dinner. <laughs> Tony says, get some vodka in that bottle. Just kidding. Oh, I know. Joe V says, uh, was just on Quick Mix with a different BPM, like 120 instead of 105. Uh, was just on Quick Mix 
with different BPM. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, let's see, David says, thanks, David. I'm going to get the analog course as soon as I we finish here. Great, man. Excellent. And let me know what you think. Let me know what you think. I'm interested to hear your feedback once you've gone through. It's going to take you a little bit to go through it. Uh, let's see. 101 Sal says, for a big kick like pop or rap music, how hard would you have to hit the tape machine and, and the console? It's all experimentation. It's all experimentation. Now, for the big kick like pop or rap, it depends how it was recorded. A lot of that will be done in the EQ side by shaping the EQ to give it more punch. Um, but it's all experimentation. Hitting the tape machine harder doesn't necessarily mean, depending on how the kick was recorded, if it's going to be a, a fatter kick sound. It's going to be a little bit more round, but is it going to have that punch to cut through the mix? Maybe not. It probably won't because it's going to compress and it's going to cut the transient down a little bit. So where you would pick, you'd hit the tape machine maybe a little lighter and they maybe use a little bit of EQ to get it to poke through. So it depends. It's all experimentation. Unfortunately, with this kind of stuff, there is no one size fits all. You know what I mean? Okay, let's see. Joe V says, thoughts on the the Don Musk desk emulation? Never heard of it, no idea. Uh, Joe V says, the analog course is great. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate that. I'm glad it's helped you. It's probably the my the most fun of all the courses I've put together. Mixing with analog style plugins was my favorite to do. Um, and there's nothing on the market like it, which really surprises me that with all the popularity of these kinds of plugins and every, you know, every plugin manufacturer in the world is trying to sell you their next greatest analog style plugin, whether it's a compressor, an EQ, console emulation, tape machine. And no one has ever taken the time to show people how to use them right, <laughs> you know, which really I found was such a, was there was such a gaping hole in the education market that you can have all these plugins and if you don't know how to use them, you, you're wasting your money. You're wasting your money. Right. So like I tell people, if you have those kinds of plugins and you've never watched that course, mix a song. OK, mix a song with the plugins the way you know how to use them or the way you've learned on YouTube or however. OK, then go take that course. And then after you've taken that course, go mix that same song again from scratch and then and then, you know, listen to the before and after. And I will guarantee you that if you actually watch the course and actually take notes and take your time to go through it and really apply even a third of the things that I teach you in that course, your mix will sound monumentally better than what you had beforehand. I'd be willing to guarantee that if you really take the time to go through the course. And the course is 15 hours long, my friends. <laughs> so um, it takes time. It's not made to be watched in all one sitting and to digest it all. You'll probably have to watch it two or three times over the course of a month or so or two or however much time you have in your, in your life. But I will guarantee you that if you mix a song before you watch the course and then mix that same song afterwards with the same set of plugins, the mix will be 10 times better, at least 10 times better. I guarantee it if you really pay attention to the course. So that's what you should do. That's what I would tell you. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, Bobby Booth says, Joe V, you'll love his analog course. Oh, cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Bobby. I know you have it as well. A lot of guys here have it. I, you know, I know who has them and who doesn't. I, and again, I appreciate that you guys have them and I appreciate that you're using them. Okay. Last call for questions. I'm going to head out again. We'll be back next week. I don't know if it'll be on Saturday or Sunday uh, or Friday or Saturday. I'll, I'll shoot you guys an email <clears throat> through the email list. So you guys will know. Uh, let's see. Randall says, uh, in all of David's Made Easy courses, uh, I appreciate the rabbit holes and the sidetracks David talks about. It's like a free extra content. Yeah. <clears throat> My courses are not designed to be done in an hour. Anybody knows that. I, I, don't, I don't love to ramble on. I, I'm, I make sure that the when you talk about these kinds of topics, especially for people that are new, <clears throat> It is impossible for me to say something once and have you get it the first time. You will not. There are lots of points, as Randall says, that we call them rabbit trails. And sometimes I go down these holes and I'll say things over and over again in a, in a slightly different way on purpose. Okay. A lot of times what you don't see off camera is I have some notes as I'm making these courses and I highlight certain things that I want to make sure hit home. Because if you miss that portion of it, then you're not getting the most out of the course and it's not going to help you as much as I want it to help you. So I would rather give you too much content and have you remember me saying something 10 times. And even if that annoys you, but you never forget it, 
than not give you enough content. The problem with a lot of the courses that I've seen online, by no one in particular, just in general, is a lot of them are very high level. They gloss over that they don't dive into the into the weeds. And unfortunately, with a lot of these kinds of plugins and a lot of these kinds of techniques that we talk about, you have to dive into the weeds. You're not or you're not teaching. It's there's too much detail left out. A lot of times you'll buy these courses from people and they're 90 minutes long. And you can't teach a course like mixing with analog style plugins in 90 minutes. You cannot. It's 15 hours and it could have been 25 hours. I'm all tangled up here in my headphones. It could have been 25 hours long. Okay, so it's important to me that when you guys get my courses that I over deliver the content. Okay, I'd rather give you too much than not enough. It will take you, I think Mike says, it took three months for him to go through one of them. That's about right. <laughs> Mike, hey, Mike, what's up, buddy? It took him four months to watch it once. Yeah, that's about right. If you are if you are a regular person with a regular job <laughs> and, a reg and a regular family and you have other obligations and you don't do this 10 hours a day, it could take you three or four months to go through it. It could, and it should, and you'll probably go through it again, Mike, at one point. I'm sure you will because I know you do that with other courses. These things are intended to be like um, reference manuals in a way, right? They're intended to be things that you're going to go back to and you're going to reference over and over again until it becomes second nature. And then you don't need it anymore. How does it become second nature? Practice. The more mixing you do, the more you get into this stuff, the, the more these things become second nature. And then when, we, when you're doing a mix like we were doing tonight, and I say, what compressor do I want to pick? And I know I have 40 different compressors in my, in, my, in my browser. Well, depending on what I'm doing at that particular moment, you'll instantly say, I want an LA-2A on this because you've developed that. You know what that's going to sound like on that particular instrument because you've taken all my courses, you've used the stuff, you've practiced. And now you know when you mix a bass DI, for example, you'll pick an LA-2A. You may. I do. You may not. doesn't matter. But you know what I mean? Um, and that just becomes practice. And the more you do this, the better you're going to get at it. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. Mike says he needs to reorganize. He needs to organize all his notes. And that's, no, no, that's great, Mike. The fact that you take notes, and I say that, in, in, especially in the, in the analog style plugins course, take notes. If you're not taking notes, you're going to miss stuff. Take notes. Think of it like a, like a small college course. It's what it is. It's not intended for you to learn overnight. It really, truly isn't. And so, but trust me when I tell you what will help you with your journey as being a mixing engineer. It will, I promise you, okay? Okay, Mike says, two jobs, two kids, and a wife who just walked in. Good night. <laughs> there you go, Mike. Hey, you're like the rest of us, right? You got a family, got responsibilities. Thanks for stopping in, brother. I always appreciate your support. You have a good weekend. Okay, so I am going to take off, guys. been out here an hour and 30 minutes. Thank you so much again for joining. Stay tuned to the email list so you'll see when we're coming up next week. Again, go get mixing with analog style plugins made easy. Use the coupon code um, and check that out. And if you want, again, the live mixing course that we did over the last four weeks, go to, made, go to the Made Easy page at homerecordingmadeeasy.com and look for the live mixing series volume one. It's 50% off this weekend only. If you're on my email list, you got that email with the coupon code. I think it's called... LMS50, I think is the course. will give you 50% off. You should check that out. And until next week, I will see you guys later. Once again, if you have any questions, hit me up with an email. Take care, everybody. Bye.